you know, again, when, when my father and Dinesh Patel first introduced arthroscopy to India back in the 80s, you know, <clears throat> it was amazing how, how much of a collaboration occurred between what they had here in the United States and what they took back to India. And, you know, fast forward now almost 40 years later, and here we are all together and in a virtual fashion without having to fly back and forth with a pandemic going on. And I, uh, you know, I, I'm heartfelt touched because I know my father's on this call as well. David Rajan is on this call and they've led uh, really the charge to, to join us together. So I wanted to talk a little bit about something that has, has been a bit of a conundrum for us here in, in Dallas, which is uh, the painful but functional reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. So as we know with the data on arthroplasty over the years, in 2020, the vast majority of arthroplasties in the westernized world are some configuration of an inverted arthroplasty. You know, we can all argue the debates of doing a, a polyethylene glenoid versus a, a convex metal glenoid, but the fact of the matter is the majority of surgeons are, are performing reverse arthroplasties. And as we perform more reverse arthroplasties, we'll have more revisions. But we'll also have these patients that are just painful for reasons that perhaps we never encountered with the classical anatomic hemiarthroplasty with a polyethylene glenoid. So this is an 80-year-old right-hand dominant man. He had failed two prior cuff repairs prior to his primary reverse arthroplasty. The implantation was done one year prior to his presentation to our institution. He had the usual comorbidities that occur in the United States, especially in Texas. He was hypertensive, he was diabetic, a thyroid issue, hyperlipidemia, but he had reasonable range of motion. He was able to actively elevate uh, above shoulder level. 135 degrees is reasonable to perform the majority of functions of activities of daily living. He had external rotation uh, beyond 30 degrees. He could rotate to his hip pocket. He could perform everything that he wanted to do in life. He just had pain. He complained of pain, in his words, from the moment he had his operation all the way through the ensuing year. So these are his x-rays. As we can see, he has uh, a reverse arthroplasty. This is a, a short stem humeral component. The component was performed in an onlay configuration. We see the suture anchor in the greater tuberosity from the previous rotator cuff repair. The glenoid implant has an augmented base plate with a, a metallic augment and uh, what appears to be an eccentric glenosphere. So when we measure the angles and the, the French have taught us uh, several different ways to evaluate uh, what happens to the arm with the reverse arthroplasty. And we can debate whether or not we should use angles or measurements, but at least uh, these particular angles, the distalization shoulder angle, lateralization shoulder angles, have demonstrated retrospectively to collaborate or to correlate with successful results. Well, he falls within the parameters. You know, the distalization shoulder angle in Johannes Barth's study should be 40 to 65 degrees. Yeah, this is reasonably so. The lateralization shoulder angle should be 70 to 95 degrees or 75 to 95. It's okay looks pretty good, but this man has pain. Now, when we use some of the measurements that we use, we, we see a little bit of, uh, of concern. When we actually do scale bilateral humeral views, we see that the distance between, between the acromion and the greater tuberosity is almost six centimeters. You know, that's, uh, that's over two inches. And the distance between the acromion and the lateral edge of the greater tuberosity is almost 15 millimeters. So there is not only an arm lengthening, there's both a distalization and a lateralization in this patient. Of course, as with everything else, painful arthroplasty equals infection, right? Pain equals infection. Well, we did all of our labs, our aspirations, biopsies, everything is negative. On his CT scan, we saw no osteolysis, and this is a metal suppression CT scan on the right side. You know, it's a reasonably well-positioned implant as the company who would, you know, give a technique guide to this would advocate the implant should be. Electromyographically, there was no acute abnormality. There was no cervical radiculopathy, no thoracic outlet changes, nothing in the brachial plexus, but this man had pain. So the etiologies for unresolved pain after a very functional reverse total shoulder arthroplasty with a totally normal workup. You know, uh, you know we, we teach our residents and fellows here in Dallas that uh, you know, we never trust anything. We try to trust but verify. 
Is this indeed an undiagnosed infection? Is it potentially an implant allergy? You know, we do have a small subset of patients in the United States who have an allergy to, to nickel and consequently with the cobalt chrome spheres can have an, a problem. Is this still osteolysis and notching that we just don't see on the CT scan and it, perhaps it's a different view? Or is this some type of neuropathic pain? Because the problem or difference between this type of a semi-constrained implant and an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty is effectively, we're potentially changing the position of the arm and the length of the arm relative to the neurologic uh, structures. So if it is indeed neuropathic pain, assuming all workup is negative, is it cervical mediated? You know, did we do something at the time of surgery, perhaps uh, traction on the arm when we were performing the implant, the reduction, so on and so forth? Is this a brachial plexopathy from excessive tension? Is this a peripheral neuropathy? You know, Gilles Walsh uh, demonstrated in a retrospective study that they then again performed prospectively that 50% of patients who have some type of a semi-constrained reverse implant have electromyographic changes immediately after surgery. Whether those manifest as clinical symptoms, they're still present. So this case, again, had an augmented glenoid base plate, an eccentric glenoid sphere, an onlay humeral component, but perhaps this is really something that some patients cannot tolerate with regard to the distal position and the lateral position. So we elected to reduce the humeral lateralization and reduce the distalization. So we removed the augmented base plate. At the time of surgery, of course, we sent pathology, everything was negative, multiple sections, so on and so forth. We used a, a concentric lateralized glenosphere as opposed to an eccentric or you know, excessively lateralized glenosphere, and we attempted to inlay the humeral component meaning placing the humeral component further into the humerus. The whole goal is to restore the center of rotation and the position of the humeral shaft relative to the thorax, more anatomically than it was done before. So these are the preoperative uh, angles. The distalization shoulder angle on the left side, as you can see, was 59.7 degrees. And there was a, a greater than 10% delta just by simply changing this. And we're talking about millimeters. You know, I had this discussion uh, a little bit earlier today with our residents and fellows when we were talking about uh, reverse implants, and George said it very well. You know, you can kind of get in the ballpark with a reverse, and, you know, maybe it's, it's like playing baseball with a big aluminum bat. You can hit the ball, but to really dial it in, we're talking about millimeters. So just by this slight change, there was an 11.6% delta in the angles. With regard to the lateralization shoulder angle, 3% change, but as you can see, and we're all as orthopedic surgeons, we're very visual people. It just seems that the humerus is sitting in perhaps a slightly better position. And we're using the same type of humeral implant that was used before as far as angles and such. We're just placing the bone a bit differently. But with regard to the acromiohumeral distance and the greater tuberosity distance, this is a much bigger difference. And I think this really comes to the point of how we do these types of implants. Now, we're seeking to perform what we call an anatomic reverse shoulder arthroplasty, which means we're trying to put the center of rotation as close as possible. And I think, George, you and I had this discussion a couple of years ago when, uh, when we were talking about doing this type of an implant. And there really is, at least in, in my hands, a difference between whether we put this implant on the bone or in the bone. And the position of the implant relative to the rest of the soft tissues, there's a sweet spot. So in summary, at least for me, the etiology for unresolved pain after functional reverses, if they're not infected and they don't have an implant allergy, we really need to think about a neuropathic pain. So I would encourage you to take a look at these patients who come back, who feel that they have perfect range of motion, but continue to have pain. We're always taught to evaluate for infection, but perhaps we need to think about other options.